Matthew 16 and 24 is one of the places where you turn in Scripture. And when you read the words, many people oftentimes say, well, pastor, I just don't understand. I don't understand how if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it, and how if you try to lose your life, you're going to save it. I don't understand how it can profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. It's just too confusing. And so we close the book and pretend like that's the end of the conversation. The reality of it is, is this is very simple language and it's very easy to understand. There's a difference, though, between what you understand and what you aren't willing to accept. And most of the time when we read passages like this that bring us to a place where it's uncomfortable for us to change our behavior, rather than understand it, we don't accept it and we camouflage our lack of acceptance by saying, I don't understand This is why people read passages like give and it shall be given unto you. And they go, I don't understand. That's easy enough. You just don't accept the idea that giving is God's idea. Here's what the Bible says. If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's a movement in the church world right now that doesn't even want to confess and forsake your sin. You just want to continue living in sin and let God accept you like you are. The difference is, it's not that you don't understand the process, you don't accept what God put in place. So when we read chapters like Matthew 16, we have to understand that this is easy. We just don't accept it. People read the simple language of this text, and the reality of it is, they don't read it with their right mind. Here's what he said. He said, if anyone, say that with me, if anyone he opens up by letting us know that there is no prerequisite to getting to know Jesus Christ here on this earth there are certain places that if you want to be a part of what's going on you've got to be recommended you've got to have a letter of endorsement you've got to have the right group of friends that tell others that you're validated and are allowed to attend but Jesus said if you want to come to me it doesn't matter who you are you can be anyone you don't need to be endorsed by a committee you don't need to attend any training you don't need to pass a pre-screening you don't have to go through a background check You don't have to have your temperature taken. You don't have to wear a mask on your face. If anyone wants me, they can have me. If you've got a heartbeat, you qualify. If anyone, anyone who's made a mistake, anyone who's lived less than a perfect day, Anyone who's ever made a bad choice, anyone who needs forgiveness, anyone who's ever been broken and needs to be mended, anyone who's ever been bound and wants to be set free, anyone who's ever been lost and longing to be found, if any of you qualify under those descriptions, then you're the one he's talking about. He's open to all. I saw a sign the other day that said, Jesus loves the little children, but I'm his favorite. And whether we like to admit it or not, many of us have that attitude because we love how much grace and mercy and how much goodness God can pour on us. But what happens when he starts favoring the people across the street who go to that other church? (laughs) Anyone means everyone. Not just you, but the people you don't like. What happens when God's goodness starts chasing them down and starts bringing blessings into their life? Anyone means anyone, but whenever we don't accept the fact that he's open to everyone, we immediately say, well, I just don't understand it, which is not true. You just have the wrong mindset. You're reading the Bible with the wrong mind. And here's what the Bible tells us about the mind of Christ. Romans 8 and 7, it says the carnal mind, that means your natural mind, your status of being is at enmity with God. That means that you are literally arguing with God in your natural mind all day long. Your fallen sinful nature operates out of order from the way that the word of God works. 
Because your fallen sinful nature does the exact opposite of what the word wants you to do. Here, is, the Bible tells us, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself. Do you know what your natural mind never does? Denies you. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom. Do you know what your natural mind never does? Seeks the kingdom first. It puts you first. When you read the Bible with that natural mind, your natural mind can't accept the things of God, which is why Romans 12 and 2 says you have to renew your mind. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You open up his word and you read this. You allow his Holy Spirit to open up your eyes so that you can recognize what the Bible says about the life that you can and should live. When you live according to the scripture and you live according to God's promises, I assure you, you will live the most exciting, fulfilling, blessed life that you could ever imagine. But it doesn't begin until you submit your life to him. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 23rd verse, it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It connects your thoughts with your spirit life. It says, put on the new man which is created according to God. This is why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again because he knew that the natural man could not agree with the spiritual side of the word of God. But until you get your mind right, nothing in your life will stay right. How many have ever come to church on Sunday? You've heard a message. You've said, I'm going to do that. And then Monday, everything fell apart. How many of you just got to the parking lot and you were still thinking about it? <laughs> and the reason is, is because your spiritual mind wasn't engaged in what you were trying to do. You were trying to accomplish his will in your strength. And it is not by might not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So until you get your mind right, nothing in your life will stay right, which means you've got to put first things first so that you can function in proper order. And the first thing that you have to accept if you're going to put first things first, he's God, you're not. People say, oh, amen to that, pastor. But the truth is, you don't have to amen me. You have to prove it to him. And the only way that you can prove it to him is by doing what this verse says. If any man comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus said, discipleship is easy. Just crucify your will. You see, the cross is an altar of sacrifice. And what Jesus wants you to do is take your will, your desire, your thoughts, your feelings, your attitudes, your prejudices, your bias, all of those things, and lay them on that cross and crucify them so that you can follow him. Because when you follow him, he'll take you places you never dreamed you could go. The hard part is the battle between your mind and his will. He said, take up your cross and follow me. The only thing you can do on a cross is die on it. And sometimes we over-spiritualize the problem. They say, oh, pastor, bind this because I'm under the oppression of, and then they fill in the blank. I'm under the oppression of my attitude. I'm under the oppression of this. I'm under the oppression of that. Not everything is a spiritual problem. Sometimes it's just you. Which is why Jesus didn't say, if any man comes after me, bind yourself and then you can follow me. He said, crucify yourself. You can bind spiritual things. The only thing you can do with your flesh is kill it. And that doesn't melt your heart. and You won't ever find that on a biblical greeting card, but it's the truth. People say it's hard to follow him. It's hard to follow him whenever you don't have the right mind and things are out of order. He's got to be first. People say first in what? First in everything. His first commandment, I am the Lord, you shall have no other gods before me. Let me give you five quick areas where you have to put God first. First, he's got to be first in your finances. 
One of the greatest demonstrations that you've submitted your life to Christ is that you are a giver. If you don't give to him financially, then your financial life is out of order. And you will never experience the fullness of God's financial blessings until he's first in that area of your life. Secondly, he needs to be first in your interests. Jesus said, I will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Which means that you're thinking about him. Let me ask you, how many of you find Jesus interesting? I mean, you think about him whenever you don't have to. Do you remember what it was like when you were dating your spouse? How you just think about them? I wonder what they're doing right now. I hope they're thinking about me. I wonder where we're going to have dinner. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. And this was before text messaging for me and Kendall, so all you could do is sit there and wonder. But when Jesus is first in your interest, he's something that you think about, something that you consider. You love what he loves. You're concerned about what he's concerned about. You're willing to do what he asks you to do. We live in a world that can spend hours scrolling through digital nonsense that's not going to make a difference in their life when just a few feet away is a living word that can change everything. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your endeavors and see your blessings return in abundance. When you faithfully give the Lord His tithe, you activate God's covenant promises. He said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. With your gift of any amount to the ministry, we would love to send you Absolute Power and the Power to Prosper books. These two resources will help you chart a biblical path and achieve the good plans He has for you. For your gift of $175 or more, we'll send you the entire Power Box straight away. This power-packed bundle of resources includes the Power to Get Wealth three-part sermon series, the Prayer Journal, our Master Your Money exclusive interview, and the Power Mug, in addition to the Absolute Power and the Power to Prosper books. Sow your tithe and watch as he opens the windows of heaven to bless you beyond measure. Send your gift today. Call the number on your screen or visit jhm.org slash firstfruits. Is he first in your relationships? It doesn't matter what the relationship is. If you're single, he needs to be first in your relationships because the Bible says do not be unequally yoked with non-believers. You do not date to convert. Dating is not the first line of evangelism. You find a believer. Is he first in your relationships between husband and wife? If he's not, then your marriage is going to constantly be in a state of struggle. Why? Because anything that's not first is out of order. Is he first in your schedule? How many people come to church and they say, oh, pastor, I'd like to do more, but I'm just too busy. Well, yes, you are. Because if he's not first in your schedule, you're going to give your life to chasing things that are never going to give life back to you. If you find it hard to find time for Jesus, then your time is upside down and it's out of order. Is he first when you get in trouble? See, this is real easy. Finances, interests, relationship, schedule, trouble. What's that spell? First. You'll find out what people believe in whenever they get in trouble because that's where they turn. When life gets too hard, do you turn to the bottle or do you turn to the Bible? When you want to make the pain go away, do you swallow something or do you hunger and thirst for him? The scripture says that he is an ever-present help in a time of trouble. That means in a day of trouble, you turn to him first. You follow him. Why? Because he will lead you in paths of righteousness. He'll take you through the darkest valleys of your life, and he'll be right beside you. David said he'll lead you beside still waters into green pastures. He's the one who can walk on the winds of a storm and calm the waves in your life. He's the one who will stand beside you in the flames of fire 
on your greatest trial. He's the one who will watch you rest while the lions sleep so that you can demonstrate to the world the kind of God that you serve. Child of God, if you're in a day of trouble, turn to him first because he is a refuge and he is a strength and that's the kind of God that we serve. When you put first things first, the second thing that you have to accept is that his ways are not our ways. How many of you have ever talked to God about a problem and then you gave him steps one through ten how to fix it? I want you to do this and then I want you to do this and then I want you to do this and I'd like all that by five o'clock. That's the way we work. That's not the way he works. You know, there's a lot of people say, oh, God's got a plan for my life. I'm going to shock you. No, he doesn't. God's got a plan, and he'll let your life be a part of it. But it's not about you. It's about his will. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. We don't accept that. We like my will be done. But the reality of it is, is God's plan is something he'll let you be a part of if you want to. Oftentimes, we believe that it's all about us. The reality of it is, it's all about him in us. In Isaiah, he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You say, well, how high is that? Believe me, it's out of sight. I don't care how many billions you've got to blow in space, you can't fly that high. When you put first things first, you recognize that you can live the kind of life he promised. What kind of life is that? Read John 10 and 10. Life more abundantly. How many of you have room for more abundantly? Never met anyone. Oh, Jesus, don't bless me anymore. (laughs) Which means if we're going to live that kind of life, we need an adjustment. I'm not preaching this message to tell you you're doing it all wrong. But there are places in your life that need an adjustment because they hurt too much. The other day, I had a pain. Never had it before. Some people said it's a sign of age, and I rebuked that. But it started in my earlobe, and it went all the way to my ankle. You ever had one of those? You just don't know what started it, but you want it to stop? Kendall said, did you do anything? I said, no. She said, did you lift it? No. So I called a good friend of mine. He's a church member, and he's a fabulous chiropractor. And he said, you need an adjustment. And he could have told me, you need to stand on your head in a bucket of water. I said, done. So I went to his office and I laid on the table and he hovered over my back like the spirit hovered over the waters in Genesis. (laughs) And for a while, he just mumbled things. He went, "Mm, mm mm-hmm, oh, yes, oh, I see that, mm, oh, and then there, oh, yes, okay. Then he counted to three. When the chiropractor counts to three, brace yourself on two. Because three's just a bluff. He said one, two, and it sounded like he grabbed two bags of chips and just pushed them into my... But the good news is, is when he got done with all of that cracking and whacking, the pain went away. And I said, what happened? He said, I needed to adjust you so you could get back into alignment. He said, your body was out of shape. He said, your shoulder was going this way and your ribs were going that way and your hips were going that way. And he said, your entire spinal column was all out of whack just because of over time not moving properly. You've created these problems and you could still move, but it hurt too much. And I got to thinking about how many of us in the body of Christ need an adjustment because when you read Ephesians it says Christ is the head of the body 
Colossians says he is the head of the body. Meaning that if we're not in alignment with the head of the body, then everything that we do is going to be more difficult than it should. It's going to hurt too much. And one of the reasons that it hurts too much is because we don't trust Jesus. We put more faith in our traditions and our experiences and our past than we do the promises of his word. Let me tell you something. In a world like we're living in, where things are just hard to believe, it's imperative that you know in who you believe. That you put first things first. Here's what the psalm says. It says, some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we'll trust in the name of our God. Why? Because it really doesn't matter what you put your faith in in this world, it will fail you. But God never fails you. The question that you have to ask yourself today is, am I in the right mind to do what he's asking me to do? Have you ever considered how many things your natural mind will put its faith in before it puts faith in God? I hear people say things all the time because their natural mind said it's true. Oh, pastor, did you hear? I read this on the internet. Oh, well, then it's got to be true. Financially, people put their trust in all kinds of schemes. I've had people tell me, oh, I got this tip on a new business thing that came from my college roommate's uncle's cousin's brother-in-law twice removed who used to work for so-and-so, and and he overheard such-and-such in the third bathroom stall on the fourth floor of the office building, and I assure you, it's a sure thing. (laughs) Have you ever heard that business deal before? And yet people in their natural mind go, hey, Maybe this is the one. Physically, they put their faith in so many different things. Pastor, you've got to try this cream. You've got to use this oil. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Why? Because some celebrity you never met endorsed it. You smell like a eucalyptus tree, but your hair is still falling out. How we choose to put our trust in such absurd things. But what I want you to do today is put your trust in a God who has never failed. He has never failed. He's never failed to provide because the Bible says he clothes the flowers of the fields and he feeds the birds of the air and every one of you are more valuable to him than those. He's never failed to protect He has always been a shield around the righteous. He has never failed to guide because his word is still a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He has never failed to show us the way or deliver us or be an ever-present help in a time of trouble. He's never failed in a day of sickness because his word was sent that we might be healed. He's never failed in a day of sorrow because weeping may endure for the night, but the joy that you want comes in the morning. He's never failed one moment in our past because he has made us new creatures in Christ Jesus. He won't even fail you in the future because he has died and risen again and conquered death, hell, and the grave. So child of God, may I recommend to you that you put first things first and you place your trust in the God who holds the mountains in a scale and the hills in a balance, who sits on the circle of the earth and uses this planet for his footstool. He's not a God of sometimes and maybe. He's a God of might and majesty and he is great and greatly to be praised. He is exalted and he is worthy and he is here today. Put your trust in him because he will not fail you. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Can we stand in the presence of the Lord? You're in this place and you say, Pastor, there are things in my life that are out of order. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially. There's places in me that need an adjustment to get back in alignment with what Jesus wants me to do. 
And today I'm ready to not hurt like I hurt. Today I'm ready to leave this place in alignment with Jesus who is the head of the body. And put my trust, heart, soul, mind, and body in him. If that describes you, I simply want you to raise your hand right where you are. I want everyone in this room to raise their hands and pray this prayer with me. Those of you who are watching can join us wherever you're watching from. I believe that you tuned in today because God wants you to hear his word. So join us as we pray here in this sanctuary. Repeat this prayer with me, Lord Jesus Christ. Today I come before your throne and I humble myself and ask you to forgive me for not accepting the truth of your word like I should. Today I put all of my trust in you. I place all of my hope in you. I abandon my natural mind that would resist your word and I wholeheartedly renew my mind and accept your truth. Lord, today I'm putting you first so that I can be in alignment with your will. Everything in my life that I need to adjust so that I can place my trust in you, I'm asking you today through your word and through the Holy Spirit to bring me into alignment that I might walk in your promises, in your blessings, in your strength, in your joy, in every area of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you believe he heard that, would you give him a hand clap of praise in this house today? The Bible is the greatest financial manual you will ever read. Honor the Lord with your first fruits, and everything else you touch will be blessed. When we put God first, everything we do prospers. Following God's financial plan ensures we will not live under a financial curse. Place Him first in your life and receive divine favor and blessings. Thank you for all that you do, our partners and friends, to faithfully support the mission of this ministry. May God's blessings be upon you. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up. God has made it possible for us to reach the nations of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We are saving the world one life at a time. He who saves one life saves the world. The latter years are going to be greater than the former years. Honor Pastor Hagee's 65 years of ministry and go to jhm.org slash 65 years. Cornerstone Church invites you to Feast 2023, October 20th to 22nd. This is an event you don't want to miss, filled with midway games, food, free rides, and spectacular fireworks. Musical guests, Planet Shakers, and Torrin Wells. A life-changing message by Pastor Matt Hagee. Sunday evening, we will conclude with our Night to Honor Israel with Pastor John Hagee. So mark your calendars for Feast 2023, October 20th to 22nd. For more information, call the number on your screen or visit jhm.org slash feast. You've been watching Hagee Ministries. If you need prayer, call our prayer line or visit our website. Be blessed and join us tomorrow.